Good afternoon all and welcome to our webinar where we have three commercial organizations as panelists, uh, each different and diverse, uh, we'll have, where we'll have a roundtable conversation on water sustainability within their organizations, the fantastic initiatives that they have in place and what they're doing from a strategy, policy and technology perspective. Uh, whilst we have a number of broader topics to discuss, um, I'd highly encourage the audience to take the opportunity to ask the panelists questions in the chat box. Um, we'll um, we'll do a Q and A towards the end of the webinar. This might be a good opportunity for uh, for to hear that the voice of the customer and help shape future engagement with your commercial customers, whether you're a utility consultant or vendor. I'd like to give a warm welcome to the three panelists, Dale, Mitch, and Slavin, who have kindly taken the time out of their busy schedules to provide insights into their companies around water and sustainability for you all today. I'd like to throw it to our panelists uh, so they can provide a quick intro to themselves and a bit about their organizations. Mitch, take it away. Hi, uh, my name is Mitch. I'm the Senior Utility Officer at KC City Council. Um, so we're a local municipality down in Southeast Melbourne, um, stretching from sort of Endeavour Hills, Berwick area down to the coastal in Turidan. Um, we are a growth area of Melbourne, so there's a lot of rapid development occurring throughout the throughout the council. Um, and our job is to just provide services and support to all, all the residents. Um, my role specifically is I manage the utility accounts at council, so we've got maybe 800 to 900 accounts. Um, I identify energy, water inefficiencies, uh, reduce waste, um, and then I've got a key focus to um, reduce utility costs. I'm also working on our transition to net zero. Great. Thanks, Mitch. And Dale? All right. Thanks, Ash. Yeah, um, I'm the Sustainability Innovations Delivery Manager at GPT. So uh, we're an ASX listed company with about $32 billion of assets under management. And that sort of covers portfolios that encompass um, high quality office towers, retail assets and logistics warehouses. We regularly perform quite highly in uh, international um, benchmarking indices such as the Dow Jones Sustainability Index uh, and Global Real Estate Sustainab Sustainability Benchmark benchmarking. Um, we achieved climate active uh, certified carbon neutral status for all of our um, office buildings that comprise our wholesale office fund back in 2020. So it was about 20 large office assets across Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. And my role specifically, I work with our operations and our development teams across the country to deliver key innovative projects, things like um, our smart energy hubs, um, large uh, large scale uh, commercial battery installations, uh, electrification as we're getting out of gas across our assets, as well as uh, I head up our water master plan. Thanks. Thanks, Dale and Slavin. Yeah, Slavin Prodic, uh, engineering and maintenance manager at uh, Viridian Glass. So one of the largest uh, IGU producers uh, in Australia and also custom laminated uh, glass. Uh, so um, when I say custom laminated glass, I'm talking about the uh, uh, commercial buildings, uh, jail, uh, even uh, ballistic uh, glass and IGU insulated glass units. So uh, uh, better known as uh, double glazed units. Um, so we pretty much have a, a Australia wide uh, coverage. So uh, here in Victoria, we do actually have three plants. Uh, that produce uh, uh, glass in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, so uh, mainly supplying, uh, obviously, a, a building industry, mainly domestic building industry, but we do have a very um, a large foothold in the commercial uh, aspect of it as well. Um, currently, um, our organisation is actually focusing on uh, what it's called a seven-star efficiency program that's kicking in uh, next May. So we are heavily involved in uh, organizing all the necessary equipment and the procedures and the supply chain to actually hit uh, that uh, uh, challenge uh, head on uh, when it starts. And that's actually uh, de uh, delivering uh, basically um, uh, environmentally acceptable uh, manufacturing uh, methods and also uh, resource management and conservation in, in Australia. Great. Thanks, Slevin. Um, as we can see, all very different, diverse commercial customers. So while they're labelled commercial or, or, or non-res for the water authorities out there, um, very different, very diverse. And we'll jump into some specific um, uh, questions on um, on how they use water uh, shortly. So to set the scene, I've got a few slides. 
um, to help frame why it's important to take a well-researched approach uh, and strategy when it comes to water utilities and vendors providing a service to commercial customers. Our commercial customers, they operate in a complex environment um, from varying water consumption profiles to the volume of water used at different times of the day, um, on-site harvesting uh, and treatment sites of water. Some organisations have minimal requirements on water management, whilst others require granular intelligence on their assets within their buildings, factories and, and warehouses. The economic value of water also plays an important role in the consumption optimization. Um, some don't see it as a major benefit, um, whilst others count down to the actual litre on certain production lines. Larger tiered organisations uh, and the scalability of their organisations that span across Australia and parts internationally, managing up to hundreds of assets and may have multiple vendor implemented solutions um, and multiple water authorities as well, also increases that complexity on a solid um, water management strategy. Um, I've got three examples and the three examples of, of the customers are Viridian, um, GPT and City of Casey. Um, this kind of just is a, just a, a visual that paints a bit of a picture on their organisations from a water, uh, water perspective. So Viridian, they're a um, big factory site, uh, sorry, a big site with multiple factories, so factory one, two, and five. And those three factories all have different types of water consumption profiles, different types of primary meters. And they're using sub-metering to, to really get granular on the machines that use water and trying to optimize those machines. You've then got GPT Group who span across, uh, across Australia. They've got multiple assets. So they've got different types of warehouses different types of large office towers, um, different types of shopping centres. They span across multiple water retailers, so that nuance in how they're charged and the different types of level of engagements and data that's provided by the water authority. Um, and they, you know, they've got different challenges around, you know, monitoring cooling towers, um, hundreds of different assets within the building uh, or buildings and looking at different building portfolios, so different profiles of an actual building itself and how much water it uses all the types of water that are discharged from, uh, from those assets. Um, the last is City Casey. So um, this, this example, they are within, within their own municipality, obviously, because they're a council, but they, um, they kind of fall under one water retailer, so Southeast Water in this example. City Casey, they have hundreds of assets across multiple sites, and those assets range for something as simple as a toilet block that may have a DN 20 millimeter with very small usage profile, all the way to something as complex as an aquatic center that has um, a really large primary meter going through it um, or multiple primary meters going through it. Um, and then wanting to then understand um, how the aquatic center operates. So looking at different toilets and showers and pumps and different pools and different heat pumps and how those all those assets use water and where they can fine tune it. Um, so again, another consideration of how a commercial customer um, or a large organization may use um, may want to use um, water detail a bit better. So just stop sharing my screen. So we'll jump into the round table um, conversation now. Um, and we'll kick off with a question on discussing some of the drivers for sustainability within the three organisations. So, Mitch, it would be great to hear um, what's driving the council to focus on some of these initiatives. Yeah. Um, as a council, I guess our main driver would be the community and what they expect of us. Um, our job is to provide services and support to the community. Um, everything that we do needs to benefit them. Um, and when it comes to climate change, we just we have an obligation to take action for their benefit. Um, we uh, we do have some particularly vulnerable communities, um, some low socioeconomic areas and areas with high numbers of recent immigrants who may have English as their second language. Um, all the sort of forecasting we've looked at shows that those sort of groups will be the most impacted, most affected by climate change. Um, so we really need to ensure that those communities are as resilient as possible. Um, so that's, yeah, that's definitely our key driving factor, but obviously then there's the cost factor um, as a council as well, where, where our income is limited through rate capping. So, um, yeah, we need to be re reducing costs wherever possible um, with high inflation at the moment and high energy costs in particular. We've been finding that energy efficiency work has, like, it gives us the biggest bang for our buck. Um, it's got great payback period and 
it's getting better. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important for us to identify those opportunities um, to cut costs where possible and, and things that are both like financially and environmentally sustainability at the same time um, are what we're really looking for. Thanks. Thanks, Mitch. Dale? <clears throat> yeah, well, I guess um, for us, in the property se sector accounts for you know, a significant amount of water consumption, so um, as well as generating you know, quite a substantial amount of wastewater, and we also see you know, significant quantities of stormwater, often polluted, sort of tracking across um, you know, premises like in a big shopping centre, so that's obviously a big one for us. Um, so other than being the right thing to do, you know, we're driven to reduce these environmental impacts in response to what the expectations from our employees are, um, you know, our tenants in our buildings and building occupants in general, as well as the broader communities and our investors. And I guess a stretch from that also is we we publicly disclose and, you know, uh, there may be a number of people on the call who'd be aware of the task force for nature financial disclosures. So we see that as a very important means of disclosing what GPT's uh, impacts are in, in that respect. And, um, our, our dependencies as much as anything else. But given water is also a reasonably significant operating expense, um, it makes good commercial sense for us to try and make our operate our assets operate as efficiently as possible. And then I guess on the flip side of us, trying to protect the environments, um, we need to be mindful of protecting our assets from uh, you know the impacts that will come with climate change of water scarcity and flooding. So resilience and adapt adaptability is um, a very big driver for us in sustainability. Thanks, Dale and Slavin. Well, uh, we, we, we're not a huge uh, water consumer uh, compared to uh, the other two co-panelists, co but uh, we do actually have uh, three main uh, drivers for, for uh, uh, water consumption and, and uh, uh, conservation. The first one is, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the, we are in the business of um, uh, creating or making environmentally friendly uh, product. And... Uh, uh, we the seven star is actually a main driver for us to make sure that um, uh, we actually uh, walk to walk and talk to talk at the same time. So even though we're not actually consuming a lot of water, uh, we need to make sure that we are conscious of actually uh, how much water we're using and uh, to use that water in the best possible way. So if we actually are trying to sell the product that is uh, environmentally uh, friendly and uh, contributing to a, a global uh, a redu reduction in global warming, we also need to look at the uh, processes where we can actually reduce the water and uh, also improve the quality of water that we're actually discharging back into the system. The second one obviously ties in with the with that uh, good uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, corporate citizens and that kind of approach where we're actually looking at the future as well. You know, like if we are uh, uh, basically uh, trying to uh, market ourselves as a green company, we also need to uh, contribute to uh, the future as well. So uh, the water supply uh, and also um, the quality of that water that we're actually using in the, both in the system and uh, uh, discharging to the environment. Uh, needs to uh, be at the at the highest quality and the uh, the least uh, possible consumption. So we do actually have uh, recycling systems uh, in place and uh, multiple filtration systems. So in the past, for argument's sake, we we had a sacrificial systems where we were literally pumping the portable water into the uh, um, manufacturing plant and we were just using it once and then uh, discharging into our sewer and uh, um, uh, that was that was basically the best practice. These days, obviously, that's not acceptable. So, uh, so we are reusing water up to fourteen or sixteen uh, cycles. So, uh, water that actually comes into our system will actually go through our production system uh, fourteen to sixteen times before we discharge it back to our sewer. So, uh, uh, as I said, our main driver is uh, sustainability. It's nothing to do with the uh, uh, cost effectiveness. Because uh, if you look at the uh, you know bigger picture, we are very very small consumer of water for our production. Great, thanks, Slavin. It's interesting to see the different types of drivers. You know, we've got vulnerable community groups to operational expenses and seven star programs uh, to help drive some of these some of these initiatives. So let's let's discuss some of the the vision and strategy and and I guess some of the goals in relation to to sustainability. And it'd be interesting to, to know if there are defined targets around some of these areas uh, in relation to water efficiency. Uh, Mitch? 
Uh, yeah, we've, uh, at Council, we've re released our um, environment strategy recently, I think last year, which um, is kind of an overarching strategy for um, yeah, our sustainability vision and goals. Um, our main aims are to be climate resilient, so that's just managing heat waves, bushfires, coastal inundation, drought. We get pretty much all, all the effects in KZ. Um, enhancing our natural environment. So we want to increase canopy cover, provide more open space to residents. Um, since COVID, that more open space has been a pretty big focus for the community. Um, we're looking to develop a circular economy with business and reduce waste. We want to become a water efficient city. Um, our carbon neutrality targets are um, 2030 for the organization or council um, and then we've got a community target as well for carbon neutrality by, by 2040 for the entire entire community um, for water specifically we have a target to reduce our potable water use by 30 percent by 2030 um, that's our forecasted use so in the next seven years we'll probably add you know a dozen new reserves two or three dozen new community centers and buildings and kinders um, so we basically have to forecast what our usage will look like, um, taking into account all those additional assets, and then we're hoping to reduce that by 30%. Um, we've also got goals to um, uh, re renew and upgrade all our water-sensitive urban design assets, so um, all our wetland areas, stormwater harvesting systems, rainwater tanks, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mitch. And Dale? It's a GPD group to me. Well, I guess uh, on top of... Um... As I mentioned earlier, you know, we've had a large part of businesses already uh, certified carbon neutral. The remainder of that will um, be finishing up in just over a year's time. So that will be all GPT managed sites. And we're working on co-owned and co-managed sites to assist those um, assets as well. But um, with respect to water, we're committing to being um, delivering water neutral operations on GPT owned and managed buildings by the end of this decade. So there's um, quite a bit of work for us to do in that. And I'll talk a little bit, I guess, about that later. But um, the, the main thing to do with that is that this commitment will be delivered um, with, with communities and, and other stakeholders, especially um, Indigenous groups on areas we're working in. Um, but also it's important that it has co-benefits in things like biodiversity and carbon sequestration. Um, I guess in terms of targets, um, we measure and report water efficiency, typically in a kilolitres per square metre metric on, on all assets. And each year we establish um, targets at, a, at an asset level, but also at, a, at a, um, a portfolio level, like it could be, you know, a total office, et cetera. And then there's the group-wide targets that we put in. And all of that, um, they're publicly disclosed, our performance against those targets. Um, so beyond kilolitres per square metre, we also measure in things like um, out of hours consumption, base building usage, um, what else? Oh, oh, obviously the proportion of non-potable water that's being used in our assets. So clearly we need to be driving that up. And we're also um, working uh, quite diligently to come up with um, reliable and robust metrics for stormwater management. So it's a really big area that we're focusing on. Um, and so th there'll be things like, you know, what's our total annual runoff for uh, volumes for certain uh, assets, as well as um, pollutant concentrations. So we, we've just been uh, working on our sampling protocols at the moment. So that'll help inform, you know, what those targets will be. All right. Thanks, Dale. And Slavin? Well, uh, basically, uh, our organisational vision is that... Uh, we actually have a sustainable uh, uh, production. Uh, so when I say sustainable production, we're not talking about uh, profit margins and all the kind of stuff, but we're talking about uh, leaving the planet in a better space than what we actually found it in. So we, we do actually have uh, our environmental uh, policies and, and uh, strategies are that to actually reduce the uh, both energy, waste, water usage, and uh, also to uh, engage... Uh, both our uh, community as well as the uh, uh, our customer base to uh, look for the ways of actually reducing uh, the footprint. Uh, so we're doing that obviously, as I mentioned, uh, through uh, uh, you know the walking and talking uh, our uh, ways of actually doing business, and uh, through uh, this seven star project, um, we are uh, encouraging uh, both customers and suppliers to basically adopt our lead in a, a reduction of uh, a footprint uh, or the carbon footprint in, in, uh, in our environment. 
uh, we, we're closely working with the authorities, you know, like uh, EPAs and, and uh, Southeast Water, as well as uh, IOTA, which is a great help to us, you know, like in the data collection kind of area. Um, and the goals and targets. So basically, uh, currently we are looking at the consumption and efficiencies uh, in the terms of uh, uh, liters per square meter of production. So if we produce for argument's sake like 10,000 square meters, we're trying to actually reduce that uh, liter input in the, in the production. So um, so we're closely monitoring obviously uh, pH levels uh, because the quality in our, in our production system is quite important. So, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, when we actually are discharging the uh, uh, water in the system, uh, we, we are looking at the pH levels, temperatures, uh, also how many cycles we actually uh, 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 put the water through our system. Um, uh, we also have a smaller recycling process, uh, uh, plans in place where we're trying to actually re reuse that water in, in a different means. And uh, the biggest... Uh, um, the biggest, uh, how to say, initiative is that uh, we're looking at the data collection or more data collection to see where we can actually reduce or improve the water usage. Um, so that, that's very important, uh, uh, not just for us, but for our customers as well as the uh, suppliers. So uh, some of our suppliers are very, very big uh, water users uh, in the industry, and uh, they, they're also looking at the same uh, 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 or to say goals or, or, or targets as we are, uh, so so we can all uh, work towards the common goal. Thanks, Slavin. And how do your organisations plan to achieve these goals and, and these visions um, on, on you know on the goals that you just discussed? Mitch, you spoke about a a thirty percent reduction in potable water use by twenty thirty. What initiatives is the council putting in place uh, along with other action plans? Uh, yeah, so. Um... For water, we've already been doing a bunch of different things. We've we've kind of got a heap of different teams who all kind of work in different areas, but they all kind of have something to do with water or energy. Um, so our, our two biggest users by far would be our aquatic centres and our sports field irrigation. Um, I think if you combine those two, we're probably looking at 90% or more of our overall water use. Um, so those two teams have already been doing heaps of work. So um, sports field guys, they you know, switched our turf to warm season grass, which requires less irrigation in summer. Um, all our new reserves are connected to recycled water for irrigation. Um, on the aquatic center side, uh, we've done things like install um, reverse osmosis systems, which help to reduce the amount of backwash that goes down the sewer. Um, they're continuously adding more uh, like functionality to our BMS system, our building management system. So like you can, we can monitor when the pumps are running and control the chemical dosing really, really specifically um, in the pools. Um, and then just more broadly, we're installing things like water tanks and water efficient fixtures at pretty much every building in Casey. Um, from, uh, I guess, expanding from water, looking at um, energy efficiency and emissions, we've also released our uh, climate action plan. So while the, the environment strategy was like an overarching sort of uh, guide, the action plan is very detail oriented and very specific and it outlines all the actions that we have to take to um, reduce emissions with, within both sort of the council and the community. So for uh, corporate, we'd, we'd be looking mainly focusing on things like um, building efficiency. So upgrading, um, upgrading insulation, adding heat pumps, installing solar, removing gas, that sort of stuff. Um, for the community, the big focus will be on educating and supporting them to take action. So particularly with those vulnerable communities, um, a lot of them may sort of have, they may be lacking kind of that climate change or energy efficiency sort of liter literacy um, or maybe lack financial means. So um, it's really important for us to sort of develop tools and partnerships that can provide that, that support that they need to take action. Thanks, Mitch. Dale, how does GPT Group plan on um, delivering these goals? <clears throat> We've uh, created a, a water master plan that's effectively going to underpin all of our policy commitments, and it's basically covers three main pillars. Um, the first one, um, we'll call it our foundations pillar. It's really designed to help us better understand how water is used, where it's used, obviously, and then also how it's discharged. And that covers things like you know, the status of our drawings and documentation, um, our coverage of metering, you know, our accessibility to meters, which is problematic at times, um, and then clearly the um, data transfer and data integrity of, of that information. So that and that 
spills into things like optimization programs, leak, leak detection, leak reduction programs. Uh, the, other, the next pillar is more on a resilience footing. So that looks at you know, ways to help us mitigate the impacts of say, the potential for reduced, um, well, the potential for water scarcity as well as flooding and our assets. And a big part of that focuses on um, you know, um, harvesting of non-potable water sources. So it's typically rainwater, but we also look at um, condensate from our air handling units. We're, we're steering away from black water systems and grey water systems that we've been burnt on in the past. Um, so that's helping to inform you know, what our directions. And the last of the pillars really focuses on stormwater. So we're taking a slow it down, clean it up approach and also working with our tenants to help reduce the water usage within their own operations. So it's yeah, it's we see it as an evolving piece, but uh, as integrated as, as as it needs. Thanks, Alan. Simon. So we we also integrating obviously uh, this into our project and uh, planning stages. So um, for argument's sake, if if uh, we we actually starting a project, we we're defining objectives and uh, looking for the different ways of actually eliminating or reducing the water usage. For argument's sake, or we'll, if we really have to actually use the water in the system, we, we are specifying the uh, efficiency uh, or high efficiency uh, equipment that will actually lower the uh, water consumption and also carbon footprint. Um, so um, with the current projects or the projects that we're actually upgrading, uh, we, we're looking at uh, moving away from, uh, let's say, steam operation. So going towards uh, uh, clean energy and uh, solar panels and the uh, and, uh, electricity instead of using steam and gas. So uh, that, that's actually reducing uh, our footprint as well. Um, and also um, uh, the, the strategy or the mindset is that uh, sustainability uh, doesn't actually have to be uh, expensive. It can actually be a long-term benefit is uh, more economical, uh, sorry, more economically beneficial than uh, if, you, if you look at the initial capital expenditure on the equipment, uh, if you actually uh, uh, spend less uh, uh, money at the start, it will actually cost you uh, much more in the long term. Whereas if you actually are uh, uh, looking at all these uh, design stage planning uh, aspects of the project, you will actually realize that uh, by investing uh, more to begin with in a more environmentally efficient uh, equipment, that will actually be uh, of a much greater payback in future. So that, that's the mindset that we actually are uh, trying to adopt here and uh, encourage all our project management team to actually uh, use. And uh, we are so far successful in that um, uh, uh, way of actually thinking. But also uh, the, the smart technology, you know, like it's very important to uh, Im implement and, and embed the smart technology in, uh, in uh, e existing equipment as well. So we can actually get as much uh, valuable data that can actually lead towards uh, reducing the uh, water consumption. Right, thanks, Slavin. It's great to see a number of diverse approaches to water cons conservation, you know, such as the water master plan that Dale mentioned and a foundational pillar that focuses on availability and accuracy of data. Um, we haven't had, I think we've had maybe one question um, or maybe two, a couple of questions. So encourage people um, to continue to ask questions uh, if you've got anything that you want to know about commercial customers in general or specifically about these uh, three organisations. Uh, so the next question is just around the cost of technology. With it coming down and, and new solutions coming to market, let's talk about some specific tools and practices that your organisations have implemented or are looking to implement. Uh, Mitch, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, we're, we're always looking for, I guess, innovative tools or solutions that can reduce our utility use. Um, I think I mentioned, mentioned before the, the reverse osmosis system was, I, I feel, quite an innovative technology to reduce our wastewater. Um, our sports field team, they're, they're always trying to have the latest technologies. Um, they're, we're currently switching over the irrigation control systems um, to, I think, rainbow system. Um, compared to their current control system that gives them sort of greater visibility and control of the, the irrigation, um, uh, better leak detection. I think it has like moisture detection or weather detection, so it doesn't irrigate during rain events, which is actually, it's terrible to say, but probably something that's happened a little bit in the past. Um, we're also always uh, developing new stormwater harvesting systems. Um, currently got two in development in Nariwaran and Tufton. 
Um, so they'll be providing irrigation to some of our nearby reserves. Um, and also some of the water will be pumped up to our aquatic centers. Um, I also say that um, some of those kind of projects, um, like, like Slavin said, um, we do want to leave the world better than when we, when we found it. Um, and some of those um, aren't really financially viable. So the Nary Warren um, stormwater system, we've, we funded a lot of it through grants and applications like that, but ultimately only funded about 20% of it. And what we have to pay, there's not really a payback period. So we really had to base the decision on that um, sort of on other, other benefits. So we looked at like the environmental benefit um, and we, we think about things like river and waterways health and um, just benefits to the local community. Um, and th those kind of considerations are, are also just equally as important, I guess, as, as the sort of financial viability of the project. Um, looking at what I specifically have been working on. So in my role, I'm really focused on utility savings. So um, a lot of that relies on data and visibility. Um, that's pretty easy with electricity. I can just uh, request sort of interval data and have 12 months of half, half hour interval data, like, like the next day. But um, yeah, with water, that can be pretty difficult. We have quarterly billing. It's, it's, it's really hard to get an understanding of how you're using water. Um, that's why I've been working with IODA. Um, they've been giving us real time usage at some of our priority sites. Um, through that, we've already identified a bunch of leaks and sort of issues with irrigation scheduling. Um, and because it's been so successful, we're already expanding that. Um, I know that a couple of the, at least Victorian retailers have been looking at real time monitoring. Um, and I, I just, I see real time monitoring as well as providing that data to the community um, would be one of the key ways, I think, to really help residents reduce their water use. Um, so I absolutely support any retailers who are looking to um, sort of undertake those initiatives and get more data and information to the customers. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mitch. It's really comprehensive. Lots of lots of good things that uh, that you guys are doing from a technology uh, perspective. Dale, did you want to talk a bit about GPT Group? <clears throat> yeah, I guess for us, uh, financially speaking, it, it makes a, a lot of sense for us to get things right from the start. So when we're building new buildings, we're doing going through major redevelopments, refurbishment programs. We have design briefs that have been um, put together. And so where possible in that design that gives us the greatest chance, we're looking to eliminate, you know, water consuming plant, you know, big fixtures, you know, even up to potentially cooling towers. We, we know that there's a sweet spot that we'll need to run, you know, um, water cooled systems. But uh, if we can get away with uh, not having cooling towers, that's a big thing for us. Um, that's, so yeah, that's a key one. Um, but also relatedly, you know, we want to install water efficient plant and fixtures and make sure equally that there's good access for maintenance of these things. Um, you see a lot of things go pear-shaped when, you know, things, you know, plant equipment's installed and if it can't be maintained, it just falls away and it's just got so many, uh, it creates so much uh, hassles down, down the path, obviously. And um, I know we touched on it, but for us, it's um, trying to get reliable and accessible water meters on our, to, uh, to give us that level of, um, you know, uh, granular data that helps us, you know, inform whether it's things such as um, better performance, it could be uh, associated with our neighbours' ratings, but also it could be that, you know, if we're on charging tenants for water, we want to make sure that we've got very robust systems in place and that we can uh, stand by the data that, uh, that we're looking at. Um, and I mentioned also before, um, at, at the get-go, it's very important for us to sort of build in things like, you know, large uh, rain, rainwater harvesting systems or even, you know, from a stormwater side, you know, can we put in on-site detention tanks and pollutant traps and a whole range of things so that's um, because, you know, they become so much more difficult and costly um, you know, when you try to come to them at, at a later stage. And then really on our existing assets, um, we're working through with our capital works teams on, you know, life cycle improvements, replacing, you know, equipment with more water efficient uh, equivalents, I guess. And also um, utilising, uh, we've got a very comprehensive monitoring platform. So um, staying on top of things there from an optimization perspective and, I guess when we're looking to optimise HVAC and you know um, HVAC energy, it's typically been um, what we found in the past is whilst we might be making smart moves to reduce our chiller consumption, or you know that can have a perverse outcome that actually drives up increased uh, evaporation losses at our cooling towers. So we need to be mindful. It, it still may be the, the decision we, we take, but we just need to be mindful when we're making decisions that water has to be factored into it. 
Thanks, Dale. Dale, I've got, got a, a sub question for you. Um, Mitch mentioned about waterways before, and I know there's a lot of work in the industry around um, healthy waterways and GPT Group having, um, you know, really large concrete footprints and really large um, stormwater runoffs. What's some of the things that GPT Group are doing um, to potentially uh, mitigate some of that impact to downstream waterways? Yeah, look, it's it's a really timely thing. It's a big component of what this water master plan will be. And to be honest, we're we're go, we're working through those challenges. The first thing that I'm that we've been bedding down is, as I said, as a sampling protocol. So, if you can imagine some of our big shopping centres, there's so many points of discharge. We want to try and get reliable data that we can see what are the types of pollutants um, because that's going to help us refine say, okay, are these coming from pesticides? Are they coming from herbicide? You know, like uh, are they coming from um, washdowns in uh, loading docks and things like that? So it's going to help us sort of narrow down where our focus will be. But the discharge aspect in terms of velocities leaving our site, that's a hell of a challenge for us and our peers. Um, we are looking at uh, increasing things like uh, rain gardens, um, we're looking also carefully at, say, um, poor surfaces, you know, like uh, uh, permeable pavements, permeable road surfaces and things like that actually to help slow slow things down. Um, but, yeah, it's a, a really, really big focus uh, that um, we um, be investing a lot more time and effort than ever before. Thanks, Dale. And Slavin, what's uh, Vrian doing just around some tools and practices in your organisation? So I mentioned, obviously, uh, the importance of... Uh, 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 clearly defining objectives of the projects and also uh, embedding that uh, sustainability in your uh, project management uh, or from the onset of the project. And uh, one of the things that we have actually done in past is that, uh, as mentioned before with, by Dale, uh, we have actually not just reduced, but we eliminated use of uh, cooling towers in our plant. So we used to actually have uh, heavily rely on a uh, cooling tower as a, as a means of cooling the uh, processed water. And uh, as of a couple of years ago, we, we actually cooling free uh, site. And that does actually contribute both to uh, water consumption, but also the risk to the uh, company when it comes to legionnaires and other, other diseases that the cooling tasks can actually produce. Um, <clears throat> but uh, also uh, another significant project that we've done was uh, we, um, instead of actually washing uh, our trucks and cars on site for argument's sake, uh, that water was unfortunately ending up in a uh, uh, storm water every now and then. Uh, now we actually have a program in place where we are uh, partnering with the BP and their truck wash facilities. And uh, we're taking our trucks to our uh, facilities where the water uh, usage is actually reduced uh, through our recycling system. And uh, also uh, we, we're actually eliminating the risk of... Uh, uh, water ending up in the, in the areas where they shouldn't be. Um, as I said, uh, we, we're not actually a huge water consumer, but uh, we are actually quite big on uh, protecting our image. And uh, for us, it's not about economics. It's about the uh, how we actually uh, are perceived by our customers, our suppliers. Uh, we we want to make sure that uh, we... Um, have a very good uh, uh, image in in the eyes of our customers, especially to say that uh, we are producing environmentally friendly product that will actually save uh, 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 energy. But also, we're looking at uh, uh, saying, uh, look, looking at the, the means of uh, uh, reducing the footprint ourselves. So that, that's, uh, in my opinion, if you have a bad reputation that can actually cost you dearly. Some companies have actually gone under because of the uh, bad publicity. And it uh, doesn't matter how good their product is, if they're socially or not accepted, uh, the company will actually go under. And that social license is very important, you know, like especially in, a, in a times of drought, when uh, we actually see the photos and, and footage of, of uh, dry, arid, uh, uh, you know, space in Australia, and then we're using a lot of water and uh, we, we're not actually um, managing that water properly. That's also a very big uh, contributor to our, uh, um, how to say, policy or mindset of how we actually use the water. 
Thanks, Levin. So we're at our last uh, host question for the webinar. And this question is around how the three organisations are engaging with others uh, to drive broader sustainability outcomes, specifically around water savings and efficiencies. Mitch, could you talk to some of the engagement activities the council is doing or would like to do with others in the industry? And this could be from water utilities that are on this call, vendors, consultants, or other government entities. Yeah, sure. Um, we we do work with a lot of different um, organisations, government and private. Um, we are uh, we are partnered with uh, groups like SECA and GSEM. Um, SECA is the South East Council's Climate Change Alliance. Um, GSEM is Greater South East Melbourne. I don't know. They, they're basically just sort of regional groups that foster that sort of collaborative collaborative action on sustainability and climate change. Um, we also work with a lot of uh, commercial groups. So we've, uh, we're have engaging a solar farm installer to develop a solar farm on one of our old landfill sites. And that'll provide us with 100% renewable energy. Um, we're hoping to work with an EV installer to sort of enhance our EV charger network. As I mentioned before, we work with IOTA to get that real-time water use. Um, our, our water retailer is Southeast Water. We're hoping to do some more work with them, adding more stormwater harvesting systems, adding more recycled irrigation at reserves. Um, there's some there's some big projects like that in the pipeline. There's like the Muddy Gates um, stormwater harvesting system, which is going to be a huge uh, project. Um, I know Southeast Water have also been working with us to um, sort of assess some of our recent reserves, just make sure the infrastructure, the water infrastructure at least, is, is as um, efficient as possible. Um, but on top of that, we also work with the community a lot. Um, and it's kind of, I think it's it's, it's really important that, that we bring the community along the journey with us. Um, because if if we do all, make all these sort of actions and the community sort of don't really care and don't really come along with, with us, then it's kind of all gonna be for nothing. So um, we've done things like develop a, a sustainability home order kit and a business order kit, um, which allows residents and um, businesses to sort of do a mini, I guess, energy audit of their property um, that helps them identify things like insulation caps, drafts, um, inefficient um, water fixtures or appliances. Um, and then we've got a rebate system where if, if you borrow a kit and you identify something like a, um, like you've got drafts, if you go by draft ceiling, you can get a rebate to, to cut the cost of that. Um, we also work with groups like Solar Savers who help low-income um, families add things like solar and heat pumps to their buildings. So yeah, I guess, I guess working with the community is um, incredibly important for us. Um, and I would say if there are any water retailers in this in this meeting who are looking to roll out any initiatives to their communities, um, whatever local governments you're in, I'm 100% sure we'll be very interested in helping you out. Right. Thanks, Mitch. And Dale? Yeah, well, I guess in, in the property industry, we're um, you know, members of things like uh, the Property Council of Australia, um, the Green Building Council of Australia, they drive a lot of uh, really important sustainability programs. In fact, we um, we help pioneer, well, we help develop the, the biodiversity tool that's actually used in Green Star. So we've got really strong collaborations. Um, I guess um, there's greater opportunity for us, especially, as I said, we, we've um, begun work on the water master plan and we recognise that whilst we've had some very strong collaborations with a number of the key players in Melbourne, Melbourne metropolitan area, um, as a national company, we recognise that there's so many other important businesses, organisations that we need to um, get in touch with and, and um, you know, work collaboratively on, on those projects. And, you know, beyond that, um, it's interesting this um, in my role as in, in my innovations role, I, I, it's fortunate I do get to sort of uh, see a lot of new tech and new sort of uh, services that, that are coming through. So um, it's working to see whether those are going to be fit for purpose and, uh, you know, something that we can actually roll out. And um, at, so, as I said, that's also within within uh, the property industry as, as much as anything else. And there's other areas that haven't yet properly been touched especially in our industry that we, we want to work with others on things like um, embodied water. So GPT has has uh, developed the first um, fully electric and climate active certified um, carbon, uh, well, embodied carbon building in, in one of our Flinders, uh, Flinders Street buildings. But um, we're looking more broadly at things like embodied water, which is um, a major, major uh, area 
um, you know, it, it, from um, some of the work that's been done today, we see that it dwarfs how much operational water is used when you're looking at the water that goes into the building of new buildings and the services. So we, we know that we've got an increasing number of people and businesses we want to be sort of working with in the future on things such as that. Right. Thanks, Dale. And, and Slavin? So basically, um, apart from the partnership with the Southeast Water, that actually helped us uh, with, in the mapping of our, our wastewater and also potable water demands, um, uh, we, we have actually developed a quite good relationship with IOTA, like you guys. So we're collaborating on, on that technology and uh, trying to actually uh, uh, collect as much data as possible in in a uh, real time so uh so the systems that uh, iota is actually providing are quite good so you guys actually have a very good platform where the customer can actually go and, and actually analyze the data as well so um that's in my opinion that's quite uh, important because without data you can't actually uh, uh, assess where you're at and uh, where you want to be um, also, we're developing a community awareness. Uh, I mentioned that uh, with our customers and, and suppliers, but also um, in our marketing strategy, we are promoting uh, the green product and uh, we're also talking about uh, all aspects of the sustainability you know, energy. So we, we are looking at uh, uh, investing uh, quite a lot of money in uh, uh, solar panels um, also, uh, we've just finished the uh, uh, the LED lights upgrades in uh, three plants, which was a uh, quite undertaking, and uh, we have actually reduced uh, carbon print uh, carbon footprint quite a lot uh, just by doing that. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, looking at uh, different companies that can actually provide us with information and and uh, sustainable uh, solutions. Uh, our supplies, for argument's sake, I mentioned the. Uh, the new installations or projects that we're running, we're demanding from our customers to uh, give us uh, the equipment that's actually uh, sustainable. And, and uh, if we can't eliminate the water use in, in the, that equipment, then uh, at least reduce it. So um, so it's it's uh, pretty much, a, I wouldn't call it a holistic approach, but uh, you need to make sure that all aspects of the uh, collaboration that you can actually have is important. So both governments, you know, like Southeast Water, IOTA, uh, educational uh, institutions, like uh, we're going through apprenticeship uh, program uh, right now with the uh, Chisholm, and uh, that's also uh, we, we're emphasising uh, to them that uh, they need to actually incorporate the sustainability uh, aspects of the education as well to our team members. So um, uh, every every little bit actually does count. Right. Thanks, Slavin and, and Mitch, for the, the footprint IOTA plug. I think the right data and analysis is key to optimization. I, I do apologize. It's it's actually not a plug. When you actually see something that's quite good and, and it's uh, beneficial, uh, uh, you need to share that. So I wouldn't call it a plug. I wouldn't call it as a commercial uh, exercise. Uh, I just uh, call it as it is. It's a very, very good tool. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, Slavin. Um, look, so for the audience, we can see there are plenty of opportunities for people within your organisation to reach out to commercial customers and engage. Um, as we've seen here today, Viridian, City of Casey and GPT Group are progressive uh, organisations in their ambitions to focus on water conservation and broader impacts to environment and communities. We might pivot now to some audience questions uh, for Mitch, Slavin and Dow to finish off the session. And I'll just bring them up. Um, we've got a few. For the ones that we don't answer, we will take them on notice and we will get back to you um, with, with those questions or with the answers. Um, so we've got one here. Gunter has asked, um, do you have measured and verified savings? How? Who looks after the system and ensures it is maintained and the alarms are actioned, actioned on? Um, Anyone, either one of the three, if you guys want to jump in and talk about um, how potentially you maintain and monitor your system, so your BMS systems or your um, your platforms. Uh, I think Dale, you might be on on mute. Sorry, yeah, I'm I'm happy to to start that off if you like. Yeah, um, so we have a, a very elaborate monitoring system, and so we'll actually put in operating alerts, oh, various alerts, whether it's you know our um what our baselines are, our overnight profiles, et cetera, and any exceedances. So we've got reasonably good granular data. And, and so we therefore look at um, applying, you know, how much uh, 
how much that financially is, uh, is uh, you know, we're getting uh, value from, from those uh, alerts and notification systems. Uh, our bigger ones tend to be um, accidents that take place in, in maintenance. So occasionally we see um, people coming to clean our cooling towers, somebody either forgets to, actually it's worse when they forget to turn the makeup valve on because the cooling tower, <laughs> but, um, or if they leave the drain valve open and, and you'd be amazed how often that, that can actually happen despite, you know, protocols in place. But because we've got good systems in place, we can pick that up because otherwise, you know, those type of losses would be you know, quite significant. Thanks, Dale. Did anyone else want to contribute to yeah. that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess for measurement and verification, we've done some larger projects where you, you know, you monitor for 12 months and then you do the upgrade and then you monitor the sub subsequent 12 months. Um, but I guess it depends on the, the size of the work um, or the project. So for a lot of the smaller ones um, at council, we're very, I guess you, they always say we're very siloed. So we've got a lot of different teams who do different work and it ultimately just comes down to whatever team in, initiates the project is the one who should be following up and ensuring things um, are running properly. So for us um, with the IOTA program, for example, we're currently going through a process of um, testing out the alarms and just um, adjusting the sort of levels um, so that we pick up exactly what we need because um, it's difficult. We have, we, have, we have some sites that are just a single toilet with, a, with one toilet and a tap. And it's we can we can have a very low alarm level, but um, for another site we've got has um, it's a huge sporting complex and it has I think like fifteen sports pavilions. It's got irrigation, it's got everything, and so we need we need to adjust that because we can't send a plumber out to find a you know a one hundred mil a minute leak when they could be spending two days there just to find it. Um, so yeah, it's comes down to the teams and yeah, just having to play around and, and make sure we follow up on the work we do. And sometimes those M and V um, works are made harder because you, you may not be able to isolate the impact of factors like for us, you know, occupancy in our buildings because of COVID and the post COVID, and also you know climatic changes. You know whether this is going to be much hotter summer will, will obviously drive things as much as our um, optimization work. With, with us, obviously, we're controlling it through our, uh, KPIs like you know liters per square meter, but also uh, uh, the Second part of the um, question was uh, who actually monitors that and uh, do we have an automated system? So we actually realized uh, how important uh, this particular platform IOTA is once they uh, actually went down because of our uh, issue, which we haven't actually updated the, our network properly. So we, uh, we had a cyber attack and we had to isolate uh, a particular platforms. And uh, we realized you know, how important this uh, IOTA uh, platform is to us because uh, myself and uh, another colleague of mine were the only ones who could actually have uh, uh, both input and also the visual control of what was happening whereas right now multiple uh, people from our different departments can actually uh, raise the alarms and and uh, see if the, there is a, a increase in usage and stuff like that so Thanks, thanks, Slavin. And Gunter, I hope that's answered uh, answered your question. Um, got another question here around how do you convince stakeholders the value, purpose, and goal in collecting environmental data metrics like electricity usage, water consumption, and waste of data, i.e. site managers, procurement accounts payable? Um, maybe Dale, you might be best to, to answer that from a you know, from a GPT to facilities managers at your different shopping centers. How do you convince them um, the value of the data that you want to that you want to collect? Yeah, that's interesting. Um we're, we're, we're extremely fortunate that um, because of a lot of great sort of um, initiatives that have been put in place by sustainability across the business, and they've actually more than had their fair share of financial returns, that, G, that sustainability in our company is, you know, it's part of our DNA. So all the way up to our CEO, when we have town hall meetings, one of the first things beyond safety, he will talk about is uh, sustainability. So we... It's it's pretty much well and sort of across the whole board of all people who work with us. And yes, you know, um, water, you know, savings from water are not like uh, energy, etc. And and um, we've probably been able to do so much more with um, reducing our um, our energy charges. Not so much just even our you know costs for supply, but our demand charges, you know, through KBA and other things like that. But at the, in the same breath, um, water is held in in um, 
in a very high account. When we have new, if we take over new new properties and bring people on board, we've got a very strong uh, induction program to, uh, and we reinforce the importance of sustainability, like what you know Slavon was saying before, beyond just the obvious of you know what, what's a simple payback. You know, it, it goes way beyond for for a company like us too. Thanks, Dale. And Mitch, um, there was a question asked by Mohammed around what's the biggest limitation to send water bills quarterly versus monthly? Is there a way to streamline commercial water bills? I think you mentioned um, in a previous question or an answer around some of the limitations around getting your bill sent quarterly. Did you want to expand on that? Yeah, um, I guess there's there's two sides. I, as far as I'm aware, water retailers only uh, bill quarterly. I could be wrong about that. Um, from our perspective, um, it was largely a timing, like an amount of time that staff had issued um, when we had 300 accounts, um, each invoice having to having to be checked individually and processed individually. Um, it was it probably wouldn't have been feasible to be getting 300 every month. Um, so what we've done recently is we uh, engaged with a um, utility management software company. Um, Azility is the company. Um, and we... Um, yeah, all, all the invoices get automatically uploaded into that. They have a sort of a traffic signal assessment where they look at things like tolerance limits, like has the water increased from the same time last year, that sort of stuff. Um, and then once, we, once we've approved them all, they get paid in sort of one bulk batch. And effectively, that's really um, cut down significantly the amount, the amount of time we spend looking at utility invoices. Um, and so with that system in place, we could easily be um, processing monthly invoices if that was something that the water company was able to also do for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. There was a question um, around uh, Shirley asked, how can academic institutions and universities be involved or collaborate in your project? So I might open that up to uh, all three of you. So, so I'll start with uh, what we're actually talking to because uh, uh, we, we, we're starting our apprenticeship program and one of the items that we have actually spoke to uh, Chisholm for argument's sake is that uh, how do we actually embed the environmental uh, aspects of training? So uh, the mindset obviously on, on uh, uh, energy consumption or reduction, uh, water consumption reduction. So all those kind of... Uh, holistic approaches if you want to call it that way but uh, in a sense that uh, if you if you don't actually start talking about those things or at least mentioning that in a, in a education uh, you will not actually get far so our uh, or at least my personal opinion is that the best way to actually uh, change the uh, the mindset or, or the, the behaviors is to basically start uh, young and start embedding that into uh, everyday uh, living uh, and uh, making sure that uh, people actually don't actually look at the environment as uh, uh, the cost uh, effectiveness or, or the cost to the uh, the budget, but uh, also the future investment in the sense that uh, if we actually do the right thing now, the benefits will actually uh, be uh, tenfold in uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Right. Thanks, Slavin. We've got three minutes left. I might just ask one more really quick question. This is kind of a question to... Um, to, to you three, back to, to the audience for those who are online and water utilities. What would you like to see more um, from water utilities from an engagement perspective, from a solution perspective? Um, from my perspective, um, like I mentioned, data is, is the key and visibility of your water use. Um, so I think having real-time water meters, digital meters, um, and just providing that sort of data access to the customer will be really important. Um, from a really selfish point of view, I would also say um, considering the business customers um, can have multiple uh, assets. And so um, I get 10, maybe 20 emails and texts a day saying your meter is using a lot of water or your meter is being changed over um, with with no details about what, what the site is um, because it's, it's tailored to residential customers who only have their own house. Um, and so I have no no way of finding out what meter is using too much water or, or what meter is being changed. Um, and so it's, it's effectively useless for me. Um, so that, that would be very helpful, but it's not particularly important to probably anyone else. Right. Thanks. So we have to wrap up. We are at time. Um, so for the questions that we didn't answer today, um, we will um, ask the, the panelists and get back to you uh, individually. 
So that's a wrap. I'd like to thank uh, again, uh, Slavin, Mitch and Dale for taking the time uh, to talk about their organisations. And thanks to you, the audience, for attending. Um, for those who are close to the customer in your organisations, this is a great example of diversity in this space. And I encourage you to seek to understand, which will potentially help shape the future on how we can support this customer segment in reaching common outcomes. We hope you took a piece away out from this uh, insights shared today. Thanks very much. Thank you. See ya.